Well, well Tom, maybe, maybe this, this is, is the perfect, perfect opportunity that you just spoke of. of. Reuniting, Reuniting the boys with the neighborhood. Maybe, maybe. Oh, I guess I should go introduce myself. Uh, this part is always so awkward. <laughs> well, hello there, neighbor. Hey there, Tom Taylor, your next door neighbor. Well, it's nice to meet you. My name is Hal Orlin. Yeah, you too. Looks like you uh, got things settled. Sure had a lot of stuff to move in. Yeah, we pretty much got everything moved in. We just moved over here from Hospers, you know. My wife got a new job at the local TV station, co-hosting a new show called Spool Time. Yeah, it's about sewing and all that stuff. Oh, that's pretty cool. Well, it was nice to meet you. Yeah, it was nice to meet you too. Hey, Willie, is that you? Willie, is that you? Hey, how do you howl there, Tom? I couldn't hear you, I was just practicing my A minor pentatonic scales. What are you doing over there, Willie? Hey, I'm just practicing up for our gig this weekend. You know, I'm in a striper cover band. Wow, I had no idea. Hey, so Willie, I met my new neighbor. Oh, really? Good for you. What's his name? Uh, Cal, Sal, Al. Oh, man, I just had it now. I can't remember. Say, so, you know, Tom, sometimes remembering someone's name is the best way to show them that you care. I know, but he's just my neighbor. So I was playing in the church praise band this weekend and the pastor gave us a challenge. What if when Jesus said, love your neighbor, he actually meant your next door neighbor? Whoa, that's, wow. I guess I can't argue with that. Okay, next time I see him, I'll get his name again. This time I won't forget it. Hey, that's a great idea, Tom. Say, you want to hear a new single? It's called Yahweh. <laughs> Well, it is great to be with you all this morning. Um, I actually moved to Spirit Lake about two years ago with my husband. And uh, tell you a little bit about moving to Iowa, if you don't know what that's like, because I'm sure a lot of you have been here for a while. We're from North Carolina. At least that's where we lived for the past eight years before moving here. And when I would say, yeah, we're moving to Iowa, people would say, Iowa? Like I had said, Africa, seriously. And I don't think that we are doing well in geography, at least not in North Carolina, because then they'd always say, oh yeah, she's going to Idaho. They had no idea where Iowa was. And then the next question was always, why? Well, God had designed that for us. We, we have all confidence in him that he brought my husband uh, to Okaboji to be the director of family ministries at Good News Community Church there. So... But before we were in North Carolina, we were in Colorado for nine years, and my husband and I were both on staff at LifeBridge Christian Church, where the other two authors are from, Rick Rusal and Brian Mavis. So that's kind of a bit of the journey of how someone from Spirit Lake via North Carolina writes with people in Colorado. <laughs> so, all right. Well, um, I was in the middle of editing and researching for the neighboring church when we were deciding to move and then subsequently moved. So when Steve and I made our first visit to the lakes, which we just were not expecting what we saw at the lakes, it's gorgeous. We are so blessed there. Um, but the hiring team really welcomed us very warmly. And we stayed at Arrowwood Resort and they left us a basket of goodies. Um, when we first arrived. Uh, it was there at the, the counter for us. And uh, it had a card inside of it. And it said, the card said, and here, here we go. Okay. It said, this place where you are at right now, God is circled on a map for you. No pressure or anything from the hiring team with that. But no, I've gotten to know the person who, uh, designed, who gave us this card very well since then. And um, she is quite a prayer warrior. And this was by design because she did not know that I had been studying a lot 
Acts 17, and struggling through what does it mean to love your neighbor with my co-authors, and had been interviewing about 30 pastors around the country to find out what they thought love your neighbor means. And so I do believe that Acts 17 is where this sentiment comes from, so I want to take a look at this uh, as one of our verses we look at this morning. Paul says these things uh, in his sermon to the Greeks in Athens. So if you have your phone or your Bible, you know, you want to look it up with me, that's Acts 17, 24 through 27. Then God, who made the world and everything in it, is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everyone else, everything else. From one man he made all of the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from every, any one of us. There's a lot of great things in this little passage in this excerpt of Paul's sermon. I'd like to just note a couple as we get started. First, God doesn't live in temples built by human hands. This would have been a pretty big deal back then for Paul to have said that because many of them took treks to go to the temple and not just the Jewish temple, but they, if you know anything about the Greeks and you know about the gods, it was all about building the temple, building the statues, going to see the gods. And the early church was markedly different because they worshiped a God that was with them everywhere. Jesus walked with them, and then he spent his, sent his spirit, and his spirit's still with us. Somewhere along the way, I think we forget this point sometimes. We always kind of want to put God in a box. It's a little easier that way to think that God exists even here in this church building only. But it's not the center. It's the refueling station, in my mind, is what the church should be. Church is not the place where all of our formation and spiritual maturation happens. Home. I believe that home is that primary place. It's where you read your Bible. It's where you pray. It's where you live in relationship and you truly live in community. Home is the place where we practice our faith most fully. It is where we love and forgive most often. It is the place where we live out the spurring one another on to love and good deeds. And if you are a parent, you know that you are constantly spurring your children on to love and good deeds. It's a place where we honor our mothers and fathers. It's the place where we try not to exasperate our children, but to bring them up in the knowledge and the grace of the Father. Home. It's at our homes where we show that Christ lives in us, or if he doesn't. The second thing to note is that God marked out the appointed times for them. Whether you have lived in your neighborhood for a long time or you just moved there, like pastor, <laughs> or getting ready to move, you have an opportunity. You get to go on an adventure and explore why. Why do you live where you live? God already knows that you were going to live there. He's determined that. He's determined the boundaries of the land that you live on. So why are you there? It's more, neighboring is more of an adventure of exploring where God is already at work in your home and in your neighborhood. God did this for you. So you would seek him and reach out for him, find him, and help others in your neighborhood find him as well. Now when you came in, you probably saw a card sitting on your seat. I want to encourage you to get that out. We're going to start with a pop quiz. We can go ahead to this slide. Like I said, home is the center of your ministry. Church is important, not telling you not to come to church. <laughs> but home is the center. It's where you spend most of your time. It's where your most influence happens. And I would say sometimes we've given up the influence that we should have and could have in our home and the surrounding areas. So we're going to take a little pop quiz. I do want you to actually do this. Get your pens out. And I know there's a pen in, in the pew in front of you if you don't have one. And I want you to write down 
the names of the people in your home. That's the center of ministry and relationship. And then do your best to write down the names of your neighbors that live around you to the left and the right and in front and behind. And if you live on a farm, I know you know who lives on the farm next to you and owns that land. So go ahead and write that down too. There's not an excuse. Just because we live far away from each other, we still have neighbors. I grew up on a farm. And I know we still had neighbors. In fact, my dad had great influence and neighbored well, even though neighbors were two miles down the road or more sometimes. Now, one of the pastors that I work with with on the book project he does a lot of traveling he is a pastor of a very large church i'll talk about that church in a little bit and he didn't write this book because he was great at this he wrote this book because he was convicted by this because he couldn't fill out this sheet he couldn't fill out this sheet. He actually nicknames this, if you ever hear Rick speak, the sheet of shame. <laughs> he, lived in a very, he lives in a nice neighborhood. He's lived there for a long time. His wife could fill this out pretty well, but he couldn't fill it out really great. In fact, he called the, wrong, the, the neighbor by the wrong name for a while, didn't even realize it. <laughs> okay, so this is not, this book and this does not come to you as people that are experts in this. These are people that are along the journey, very convicted to take this commandment very literally, which I know Russell talked about last week. Maybe you know your neighbor's names. Maybe you've lived here for a long time. Do you know their dog's names? I can tell you, my new neighbor that I made two years ago when we moved here, I actually learned her dog's names, Boji and Dork, <laughs> before I learned her name and got it right. Maybe you do know your neighbor's names, but do you know a hope that they have or a dream that they have or a hurt that they have? In a couple weeks, you're going to talk about one of the practices of neighboring, which is prayer. And those are things, knowing a hope or a hurt or a dream, those are things that you can pray for. I'd also want to ask, do you know one of those things about the people in your own home, a hope, a dream, or a hurt? Well, I want to challenge you to fill this block map out. Keep it. Keep it throughout this sermon series. You may not get them all right now. You may need to go home and confer with a spouse or with your children. Your children might know who lives in all those houses and their dog's names as well. But I want to encourage you that in the coming weeks and months and year, that God has a purpose for you in this place. Seek him in your neighborhood, and he will reveal himself to you and your neighbors and he is already working there. I know he talked about last week, Russell did, talking about loving your literal neighbor. And he did a great job of defining what neighbor means. So today, I want to talk about another part of that command. And it is the word love. The love part of this command. Jesus gives the command to love multiple times in multiple ways. We're going to look at John 13, 35 and a couple other scriptures about love. In this, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And we also know that Jesus said to love your enemy as yourself. And let's look at Luke 6, 27 to 36. He says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those, and we're going to go on, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners 
lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Well, anybody out there have a neighbor who might treat you more like an enemy? Don't raise your hand, because you might have a neighbor in the room, okay? <laughs> as a kid, my husband Steve had a neighbor whose dog's name was Satan. Can you imagine having a very neighborly relationship with someone who calls their dog Satan all the time? He was part German Shepherd and part wolf, the dog was. So he had that name rightfully so. And there's a lot of story about that dog I will not tell you. <laughs> um, but why does Jesus to tell, tell us to love our neighbors, to love one another, and to love even our enemies? Now, one obvious reason can be that we can share faith with them. He says that they will know us as disciples by our love. And of course, love can help people take that first step in knowing Christ. And I do think this command to love is a bit about a multiplication strategy. It's Jesus' way to grow the church. But it is also more than that. Your loving your neighbor is not just about their faith. It's about yours. Love is a defining characteristic of a growing disciple in Christ. My co-author, Brian Mavis, he said this to me once, I don't know if loving my neighbors has been good for them, but it's sure been good for me. Loving our neighbors gets us out of our comfort zones, and that is where growth and maturity almost always happens in real life. Love the neighbor who is like you and love the neighbor who is not like you. Love the neighbor who is lovable and love the neighbor who's not. In this command of love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus is stretching us to a bigger love. We know that because in Luke's retelling of the story, he goes on to tell the parable of the Good Samaritan, which was very countercultural in that day. A Jew taking care of a Samaritan in that day was a very big love. In neighboring, we learn to love people, and it's completely unpredictable because you may not have been able to choose your neighbors. True spiritual formation is like that. It's unpredictable. But sometimes we think spiritual growth looks like this. If we can go to the next slide. We think that it's about learning, and then we'll grow, just like stair steps. Come to that 101 class or 201 class or 301 class, which classes are good. But we think that is the only way to grow, learn more of the word, be with our friends at church, and then we'll grow like stair steps. We can often mistake spiritual knowledge for spiritual maturity. Knowing how to love someone and actually putting it into practice in real relationships in our home and in our neighborhoods and sometimes with coworkers, that's two different things, knowing and doing. But I think instead of stair steps, Spiritual maturity really looks more like a roller coaster. Love is loopy, like this. We're going along just fine in life, and something happens, and we get disoriented, and we're turned upside down. Maybe something happens in your neighborhood with a neighbor, and you're not sure how to react and how to, how to respond in love with this. Maybe your first response isn't love at all, and so you've got to go through that. And hopefully you're going through that with Jesus by your side. And as you're coming out of it, you're reoriented to a new way, a Jesus way, a Christ-like way, if you're following him. In everything, God is trying to disciple us, including and especially our relationships. So just as soon as you think you understand something, you're thrown for that loop. Something else happens and you're thrown for another loop. One of the pastors I interviewed for the curriculum, he let me know that his uh, dog bit his neighbor's little girl. I'm like, talk about being thrown for a loop. She was a brand new neighbor. First time over to play at their house with their little girl. So they had to figure that out. And if you're in a neighboring life small group, you might hear that story on one of the videos, okay? But, 
Even through that awkward and difficult situation, the pastor overheard the little girl tell his daughter, your family is the nicest I've ever met, even if your dog did bite my face. (laughs) If we reduce neighboring to just evangelism only and outreach only, we're hijacking its intent for something different, possibly minimizing the fullness of the commandment. It is for our good, as well as the good of our neighbor, that we practice love. Neighboring is a return to fellowship with God and one another. It is a vital part of Jesus' greatest commandment. We love our neighbors because we are Christians, not to make them Christians. Now, loving loving our neighbors is sharing Christ with them, not saying that. But your motivation is obedience to the command. Our primary motivation in neighboring is to be obedient to Jesus' command and to get better at what he said matters most. If we keep that in mind, it makes neighboring more focused for you and gives you purpose in it as well. Not just put the pressure on you to be nice to your neighbors and love your neighbors so that maybe they'll come to church with you. It's bigger than that. It's a bigger love than that. It's God's way of saying, I love you and I have something to show you as you love people around you. I want to tell you about a couple of my neighboring stories and it's a couple of stories of why I even got involved in this project and quit some other projects to jump on board with this one. The first one is a story about our neighbors, Randy and Brianna. Um, I'll get through this, I promise. And if I don't, you can watch it on the video because it is on the curriculum at the end. Well, we lived in a very typical suburban neighborhood in North Carolina with sidewalks and shared fences. Our master bedroom was downstairs and was in the back corner of the house near near the fence and near um, our neighbor's fence. And Randy and Brianna had three little boys and they had a trampoline that sat right in the corner of their yard where our window was of the master bedroom. And so guess when those boys love to jump the most? Saturday mornings, early. And I can, I can picture Brianna in her house saying, go outside. Those three boys were all really close in age. Well, we had at this time in our life middle and high schoolers on Saturday mornings. So we could sleep in just a little bit longer than we used to. But that really didn't happen a whole lot because of those three boys. So that trampoline was a bit of a source of contention every once in a while. We never said anything to her. I remember what it was like. I had three kids raising, raising kids. But there were more than once that we groaned on a Saturday morning. Oh, they're, they're up already. Okay. And those boys would come over and knock on our door to come get balls and things out of our yard that would cross over from one yard to the next. And I don't really remember how I met Brianna. I think it was because she was sitting outside on her, in her white rocking chair that always sat in the driveway when she was watching the boys play and ride bikes in the front. Um, I probably went over and introduced myself. I think that's how it happened. But a time came when Brianna wasn't sitting outside with the boys as much. And I hadn't seen her in a while, and I asked Randy about it, and he said that she had a stomach bug she just couldn't get over. Eventually, Randy had to take her to the hospital and get her hydrated, and they did some blood work, and then they sent her home. Well, it didn't take the doctors very long to call her right back. She didn't have the stomach bug. She had a a cancer of the blood. And it was pretty serious, and she was in and out of the hospital for months. The neighbors took turns bringing casseroles over and would just mow their yard whenever they needed it. There wasn't some schedule or anything. It was just if you were out mowing your yard, you went over and you mowed Randy's yard too and suddenly my husband and I weren't so annoyed anymore with that trampoline in our backyard in fact I looked forward to hearing those boys laughing on that trampoline on Saturday mornings and I would often see in the evenings their oldest Bryce jumping on the trampoline by himself and sometimes I'd catch him just laying on the trampoline all by himself it was a bit of his safe space A strange storm went through our neighborhood, and they never said it was a tornado, but we felt like it was a tornado because it lifted that trampoline up over the fence, over, it cleared our backyard, and it landed in a mangled mess in the school parking lot that was across the street. 
Now, their little boys thought that was the coolest thing they'd ever seen. <laughs> but I started to cry looking at that trampoline. And I said to my husband, we have to get them another one right now. We have to get them another one. Our Sunday school class had been praying for Brandy, for Randy and Brianna for quite a while. And several people knew her. And they were involved in a church family themselves as well. Um, but our Sunday school class came together. I just sent out a text, and I said, here's what's happened. All right, and by the next week, we were assembling a new trampoline in their yard. Now, Randy was a big, tough guy, football player. I hadn't seen him cry. He, was, he had made T-shirts, and it was about Brianna Strong. She was going to beat this. But the morning we were assembling the trampoline for him in the backyard was a tough morning. He felt blessed. It was kind of a tough morning for all of us because at that point, Brianna had been transferred to Duke, which is about three hours away, and was going through bone marrow uh, transplants and treatments. And Brianna, unfortunately, she did pass away six months after she was diagnosed. And neighbors drove over two hours to her funeral in South Carolina from North Carolina to be with her. That was an experience that taught me how important it is to know your neighbors' names. Because I didn't know a whole lot more about them than they had a trampoline, three boys. We had a dog that scared their boys, not named Satan. And I found out they love lasagna. And I would find out now and again things that were updates. But God grew my heart to a bigger love realizing how important it is that I know their names and I can recognize when they're not out there like they should be. But that wasn't the story that got me into this. The story that got me into talking about neighboring whenever I can is Brian's story, my co-author. They called and they asked me to come out, fly from North Carolina to Colorado so that I could consider doing this project with them. And I was, I was always, yeah, sure, I'll fly to Colorado. <laughs> but I was in the middle of some other things at the time, and I let them know that. And they were like, well, just come. Let's, let's discuss it, and you can let us know. So Brian tells me this story. He's the pastor at this large church um, in uh, Longmont, which is near Boulder. And he and I worked together for a season of time. He was over all of the church's local missions. And we had already written a book about local missions uh, together. And the church did a lot of community involvement. I was super proud of this church. We, we missed it when we left because they were so involved in the community. Several thousand people attend this church, and, and when they do a day of service, hundreds show up to clean up parks, to paint homes. I remember one summer we painted all of the elementary schools, got a new fresh coat of paint inside. From, from people at the church and other churches that we got involved because the school was having a budget crisis. The school system was. This school mentors kids and they serve food. They're super involved. They're known as the church to go to when you have, need help. So Brian received a phone call, he was telling me, from the city one day, and that is not uncommon. The city workers asked the church if they could help a resident who lived a few streets away from the church building. The resident's yard hadn't been mowed in a very long time, and the city had sent several letters. And now they were about to send a crew out to mow it and then send them a hefty fine for sending the crew out. And he wondered, the city worker wondered if Brian could get some guys from church to go and take care of this instead. So he drove over to see what was going on at this house. And he could see the grass from block away. It was five feet tall, almost as tall as he was. So he knocked on the door and a young woman in her 30s answered. Standing next to her was a little girl, and he learned that the young woman had recently survived stage four cancer, and that the little girl was a foster girl that she was taken care of. The woman was tearful, and she was embarrassed by her yard, but she literally could not take care of it by herself. So Brian rounded up his usual crew of guys uh, who can come and serve at a moment's notice. And they came and they worked in her yard that day and they got it all looking better. And they went back the next week to lay down mulch and plant some things. They prayed with her. And over the next couple of months, Brian would call and check on her every so often. And after one of those phone calls, 
Brian told me, I was patting myself on the back that we were such, good, such a good church and that the city knew to call us when I felt the Holy Spirit jerk my arm and convict me with these words, this should have never happened. If people were loving their neighbors, that grass wouldn't have been five inches tall, much less five feet tall. All her neighbors knew to do was to call the city. For years, this is what he told me, our church was serving the community and we are known for it, but were we loving our neighbors? Her neighbors didn't even know she was sick. The best they knew was to call the city and complain and they had failed. He told me, we probably have people on that street from our church and we have failed. The more Brian and the other leaders at the church discussed this situation and, and Brian's interaction with the Holy Spirit that day, they concluded that being good neighbors is better than any good program their church would ever have. Good neighboring is better than a good program. The early church wasn't full of planned outreach activities and community service projects. Not that those things are bad. I hope you guys have an awesome trunk or treat, but I really hope you go invite your neighbors to come with you. Loving our literal neighbors can't, repl can't be replaced by those things, though. The early church was full of loving neighbors. They loved during persecution and sickness and hardship and plagues. It was full of good neighbors, and that's how the church grew, actually. If you want to know more about the growth of that early church, uh, Rodney Stark has a book called The Rise of Christianity. He's a sociologist that went into it not being a Christian. Stark points out a number of advantages that Christianity had over paganism to explain the growth. While others fled the city, Christians stayed. And they, they ministered to the poor and they took care of the sick. Christian populations grew faster because they prohibited birth control, abortion, and infanticide back then. Women were valued higher by Christians, and so they were allowed to participate in worship and leading them to a high number of female converts. And the tighter social cohesion and mutual help these early Christians had for one another helped them to better cope with the disasters and the plagues facing them and the persecution facing them. This left them with less casualties than the general population. And when other people saw the way the Christians loved one another and those around them, they wanted to know why, and it gave credibility to their faith. Jesus is right. They're going to know you're my disciples by your love. Stark's basic thesis on the rise of Christianity is ultimately it triumphed over paganism because it improved the quality of life of its people. Acts 4, 32 to 34, has this to say about that. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work among them that there were no needy persons among them. I can't even imagine that. No needy persons but it's possible. Now I have to say, I'm proud of our church in, at Good News in Okaboji. We are, have some great missional communities there. We do some great things. We, we have some foster and adoptive parent groups. We have uh, another missional community that helps with a uh, food program every month. We have a food pantry. I'm thrilled to be part of those organized efforts at loving our surrounding community in the world. And I know you have those same organized efforts here, and those are good and should always happen. And the Bible talks about organizing those efforts as well. So what I'm about to say doesn't discount that. But what could happen if loving our neighbors, the eight households around us, was such a priority, even more of a priority, than our planned mission activities? I don't know leave you with one last story, and this is from my friend Danielle. She's a pastor in Colorado as well at a different church, and this church body also serves in their community in great ways, but they started to really emphasize loving their literal neighbors, not just getting volunteers to help in church and community, and some significant things started to happen, and one story struck out to me. 
there was a woman who called Danielle and said, okay, I'm doing this loving your neighbor thing, and I need to know, do you know anybody at the Department of Human Services and Child Welfare? And Danielle says, yes, I do, because um, she's on several boards and coalitions with community leaders. And she said, well, my neighbor has had her son removed from our home, from her home, and I don't think it's right. I think something's wrong in this situation. Can you ask them to investigate it more? So Danielle did. She called the head of DHS that she knows, and she asked if the social worker could look a little deeper. And it turns out that there was a very vengeful ex-husband making a lot of false claims, and if he couldn't have their son, no one was going to have their son in their family. And so upon the investigation, this woman got her son back because a neighbor cared enough to pay attention and call and get the church involved. Neighboring was about mercy and justice in this instance. And they started taking care of this woman. She had had some financial needs, and so they started stepping up as neighbors to walk alongside this woman even more significantly. Imagine if we as neighbors had our eyes opened wider to the struggles of those next door. What if we could speak love and life and mercy and justice to the homes around us and the homes around this church? What if we spoke life and prayers over struggling marriages before the moving truck showed up and the divorce was final? What if we could offer support to that single parent who's barely hanging on and her temperature's rising with her kids? And we were able to ease that burden and speak life and love into her before something happened to her and her kids. What if we spoke wisdom and encouragement to that teen next door who might play their music too loud or drive too fast on the street? That, that teen might be being bullied and we have no idea. Or what if we took a meal to the elderly couple living across the street in addition to what Meals on Wheels might do to them, for them. Yes, I really do think that neighboring, good neighboring, can be better than any good program we can come up with. And it was Jesus' grand and simple and beautiful strategy all along. Mark 12, 29 through 31 is another version of this commandment. And Jesus starts it with this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And for the Jewish people of that day, that statement, the hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, was like our pledge of allegiance. And we know how we get when it's time to say the pledge of allegiance, at least I do, especially I have a daughter in the Air Force now. And so saying this Pledge of Allegiance means a lot to me in a whole new way. But this meant a lot. For Jesus to say, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then to follow that with the good commandment, the greatest commandment, and then to follow that with love your neighbor as yourself spoke volumes to the people that were listening. And it still should speak volumes to us today. Thank you so much for letting me share these stories and share what God's impressed on several of our hearts about neighboring and taking it literally. I'd like to pray for you and pray for your neighbors right now. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Jesus who came, who has taught us these things, who showed us these, these things, who lived out what it means to be a good neighbor who told stories and parables to illustrate what it means to love one another. God, we ask that you would be with us in all of our neighboring interactions, that you would give us boldness, that you would give us much grace. God, I ask for your blessing on this entire congregation and community of faith as they go on this journey of neighboring together. Lord, be with them. Convict them of your truths. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Krista, so much. Thank you for the book, first of all, and then thanks for coming and being here today. I, um, I, I hope you guys did better than I did with this thing. I have an excuse. I just moved, but, you know, that, the, the, the expiration date on that is coming quick, too. 
So I have some work to do this week and next to get to know some of my neighbors. So um, as you go, uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.